Well, good morning. We are in uh, Proverbs chapter 19, beginning this morning in verse with verse 3. It's so great to be back with you. It's been a month, and we've been through a winter. And uh, we've, I've always wondered what it was like to live in Siberia. Now, now I know. I normally wear a sports coat. I was given uh, a sweater as a, a gift, a cashmere sweater. And I said, you know, I'm just going to wear that sweater tomorrow. Uh, it'll, if I wear a coat on top of that, it will be too hot. I take 10 steps outside and I go, what a dummy. This place is burning up. Oh, well, uh, here we go. Proverbs chapter 19, beginning in verse 3. The folly of a human overturns his way, but his heart rages against the Lord. Verse 4. Wealth attracts many companions, but... As for the poor person, his close companion separates himself. Five, the perjurer will not escape punishment, and a witness to lies will not escape. Here is six, many seek the friendship of a nobleman, and a generous person has everyone for a companion. And our last proverb this morning, verse 7, every one of a poor person's brothers hate him. How much more his close companion become distant from him. Though he pursues them with pleading, they are not to be found. Here's the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs. Verse 3, folly, comma, then an abrupt end, a limitation, a confinement. Folly, comma, then an abrupt end, a limitation, a confinement. Here's four. The reality of the world. The reality of the world. Verse five. The lie is for the moment only. The lie is for the moment only. Six. Many seek the friendship of a nobleman. Okay. The life of wisdom makes one attractive. The life of wisdom makes one attractive. And here is the, first, the seventh and final one. Making appeals to men dishonors the Lord. Making appeals to men dishonors the Lord. Okay, here's our first proverb, the folly of humans that overturns. Uh, when I first graduated from seminary, that would have been back in 1979, Audrey Harrell's father came to me and said he would like for me to go up on a weeknight and speak to his parents' Bible study in Ardmore, Oklahoma, for the summer. So he arranged it all, and we did that. We went up one night a week uh, up to Ardmore and turned around and came home at the end of that evening. I have no idea what I taught, but there are two very, 
important things that I remember from that first night. Here I graduated from seminary. I was a shiny new penny. And, uh, and the first question that I was to receive, this man sat there and said, now just exactly how many of these did we sign up for? That was the first question. But not a question, but what I will never forget is this lady who looked at me and every muscle in her face was so angry, but she had a smile. It was amazing. Never forget this. And she said, you make people sound so bad. I don't know anybody that's bad, she said. I'll never forget that. I don't even know how I answered it, but I will never forget that face. Well, the fact is, we're not born in neutral. Men are not in neutral. And the Proverbs teach that. Proverbs 1.5. We're either growing in wisdom, obtaining more wisdom, or Psalm 1.1, we're degenerating as people. Uh, we are standing, we are walking, we are sitting. The three verbs. So we're degenerating into the mocker. Man does not remain in neutral. So it's the entire question of soteriology. How does man maintain or renew a relationship with a living God. Because man is a natural born enemy. He is so bad. So bad. And this proverb displays here in a short statement the end result of having that no relationship with God. Look, the man, line one, rages there in line two. Now, this word rages is an interesting word because the chronicler takes it and uses it in a very noteworthy passage. 2 Chronicles 26, 19. That's when King Uzziah went into the temple to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. And the priests were there to dissuade him. Now, what a dramatic picture this is. Here the priests were saying no to this great king, this powerful and successful, prominent king. And this word is used. He raged at them. He pushed them aside. And then the Scripture says, with the incense in his hand, suddenly... The anger of the Lord burned against him and struck him on the forehead with leprosy. That's this word. Look at the action of this rage in line one. This word, the lexicon translates as overturns. Your translation may have ruin or subvert. It simply means to turn upside down what the Lord did to the money changers in the temple. They were busy in their business when suddenly, in their folly, it ended abruptly. That's overturned. That's what He did. Money flying everywhere. Now think about the birds or whatever they were trading there outside the temple. Flying in every direction. That's what our Lord brought about for their folly. And folly is the daily practice of feeling or sensing no accountability whatsoever to the living God. They are on their own, so to speak. And suddenly this word overturns, gives us a sudden change of direction. See line one, that is the way Suddenly the fool realizes that he's out of control or he is not in control 
of whatever he was doing. By any number of ways, he's now going to be limited and confined. You see, I hear these stories. Don't know them firsthand, but I hear and I read these stories of these Hollywood moguls who preyed upon women because of their position or their power. Now, by any number of verdicts that have been directed, their freedom has been limited, restricted, confined to a prison cell. Well, they're just like Uriah, separated. Not anymore in the social parlance of people. Restricted. And wisdom, the skill for living that created the universe and every tick of the clock is the portrayal of wisdom here among us shows again and again and again its eternal truth. It overturns the folly of the, fall, of the fool and the wicked in the affairs of life. How many times have we said it in the book of Proverbs? Wickedness is short term. It will be overturned. Here's four. Wealth attracts many companions. Everyone wants to associate with the rich, but not the poor. Now that's not the practice of wisdom. Wisdom doesn't discriminate among people whatsoever. This word, companion, is never used of a close friend. We saw that back in Proverbs 18.24. Now what I want you to notice is the two proverb, the two verbs here in our proverb. Verbs always express the action of what's going on. Look at this top line. It says attracts. It is usually translated as to add or the word to add, to understand it to be that way, to add. Pharaoh used it, Exodus 1.10, to argue to his subjects at court that Egypt must deal shrewdly with Israel or they will keep, and here's our word, adding. Adding to their population. And the second verb, line two, is separated. Meaning divide. We referenced that verb before, 2 Kings 2.11, where Elijah and Elijah were walking along together and suddenly they were, and here's your word, separated, divided. Divided by chariots and horses that translated Elijah into heaven. That's our word. Now, the Romans in the ancient world had a saying, where there are friends, there is wealth. Wealth here in the top line will bring a crowd around, hoping that starlight somehow might fall its way upon those who gather around it. But the true friend in the book of Proverbs He's not interested in what he can gain. No, he's interested in what he can give. You see, real skill for living, wisdom, is the giver. The skill for living is always adding to. Always benefiting. Never subtracting. Never taking away, always making richer. And that's the proverb. Here's five. The perjurer will not escape. The proverb regards the liar with the emphasis upon the negative fate of those who engage in that practice of folly. 
Now, this is set in the context of a legal affair. That would be the ancient courthouse in the ancient Near East. That would be the city gate right outside the city. And that would be the setting here, the idea of the proverb. Observe the top line. Doesn't open with any other definition, just a perjurer. We have seen that word before, Proverbs 12, 17. He is the false witness who does what he does for money, for power. He's the man that can be bought. The top line reads, will. Now, those are the coming consequences from the book of consequences. In the proverb, it's a future certainty for sure. Not escape punishment. There's two parallels in this one complex statement. Look at the top line closely. A witness that lies. And the second part will not escape punishment. So this top line is again a review for us what we had previously studied back in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 21. The vocabulary is almost identical. 11.21, be sure of this, the wicked will not go unpunished. That's the top line which again confirms the reality. So even though one seemingly gets away with a lie now and then, it's all just for the moment. The Lord sees all, and in His time and in His way, make sure of this is the skill for living. Here's wisdom. Make sure of this. They won't get away with it. They'll get caught. That word escape, make no mistake, transcends even life here. It goes on into the future, beyond the grave. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word that they speak. That's judgment. And that's future. A skill for living. Wisdom speaks the truth. At all times, in all occasions, in every affair, we are reminded of the Apostle's words. We speak the truth in love. That's what we're about. Here are six. Many seek the friendship of a nobleman, and a generous person has everyone for a companion. The proverb comes in the form of an observation. People present themselves in the most positive way in hopes to gain a relationship. Here's the ruler, here's the nobleman seeking to gain in life a certain advantage. Self-interest, the driving force. The proverb, line one, opens with the word, many seek. That word to seek is so an, is such an interesting word. It's a, a word that transcends all time and all cultures. It literally means to make the face pleasant. It occurs in the Old Testament 16 times. Twelve of those are regarding the person and the Lord Himself. Here's an example. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 11. 
Moses entreats. There's our word. Moses seeks or sought the Lord. He entreated Him. He sought Him. He made the face pleasant toward the Lord. O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people, he said, whom you have brought out from the land with great power and with a mighty hand? So the idea of this word to seek, to make the face pleasant, is all about the approach. Here's the way that Moses approached the Lord. Here's the way that men approach one another with an, a handshake and with a smile. It's the way it's always been. Here, a nobleman. Here, a ruler. Here, a wealthy person. Here, a person of power, of prestige. Maybe a king, perhaps a priest. We call that putting your best foot forward with someone. Perhaps bringing a gift or gifts. Now notice, and this is what's important in understanding the proverb here. Notice there's not a contrast. There's not a but here. See that? It's an and. So, line two, what does it do? It unifies, it unites a parallel situation. Look at the generous person. Notice generous. It attaches itself to the person or personality. Don't miss that. That's very important. The generous person. What does that teach us? It teaches us everything that we've been studying in the book of Proverbs. That your name, your reputation, that's what people know you for, know you as. Look how the world has corrupted that. Proverbs 22.1 They count the world silver and gold much more important than one's name. The billionaires don't care what you think of them. They don't care if you scoff at their, re mor their morality, the way that they live their lives. They don't care. They've got all the money in the world. More money than they could ever spend. They don't care. But the book of Proverbs is entirely different. Oh no, much more important than silver and gold. The riches of the world is your name, your reputation. Let me illustrate that. I say to you, Adolf Hitler, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? You see, you've formed an opinion based upon that name, that reputation. You mention someone's name and a person goes, I don't want to listen to that person. I think that person's a fool. Instant recognition because of a name. Here, it's the generous person. Because... He's known by his behavior. This is the way he is. This is the way he acts. This is the way he thinks. The skill for living sticks to you. You are known by your behavior. Now, I had lunch with the sheriff around these parts, Mr. Dan Duncan, yesterday. And we both know a family. They came from what you and I would call hanging on the edge as far as having money, having any power or prestige, but we have known them 
We've known this family together for a number of years. We have both spoken at their conference that they have, a national conference, trying to bring reform theology to a black culture. And they have sought both of us out to participate in those series of meetings. Godly family. Righteous family. And I was telling him yesterday about one of the sons who I've gotten to know out of this family. His father called me and said, I want to give you some details about a decision that my son is about to make. Would you meet with him and talk with him about this? I said, certainly I will. And I did. And uh, I listened to his proposal of what he was going to do based upon his Christian testimony and based upon his own personal convictions. I listened and I said to him, that is the stupidest thing I have ever heard in my life. And it's going to be so exciting and personally thrilling to me to see what God is going to do with this. I didn't quench the Spirit. I applauded Him. I'm from Oklahoma. Will Rogers said you can't have a parade unless somebody stands on the curb and claps. I was standing on the curb and clapping for Him. And then I told Dan, I said, now you won't believe what happened. The telephone rang. Just a couple of weeks ago. The telephone rang. Now I always tell businessmen, you can't make the phone ring. Only God can make the phone ring. And the phone rang for him. And halfway across the United States, it rang for him down in Miami, Florida. They wanted to do a Skype interview, and which led to a flight to Miami and a personal interview, and they hired him on the spot. I told Dan, I said, do you realize that's like standing on your roof with a driver, hitting the ball, it goes, ricochets off nine points and lands in the hole. Uh, an absolute miracle, an impossibility, but never a miracle or an impossibility. It's an absolute certainty and a surety. I told him that day, why, you're nothing more than Daniel, who chose not to eat of the king's table, but because of his personal conviction, toward the living God, He wasn't going to do it. And what did God do with him? I said, I'm going to be interested to watch what God does with you. I'm just going to start believing the things that I'm saying now. And off he goes to Miami in an unbelievable decision. Well, here's my point, and here's the point of Proverbs. You worry about you, your heart. You worry about your name, your reputation, your conduct. You make that the top priority. Your relationship with the Lord only. And you watch what God does with everything else. You watch what He does. He opens doors. He opens tunnels in mountains that didn't exist. Here's the way the psalmist describes it. Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7. Not from the east or the west, nor from the desert comes exaltation, 
But it is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. The Lord Jesus, you see, taught us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. He told a bunch of farmers that the Lord would provide the end product of all their labor, which was bread. I don't think that he was thinking about the end product of all their agrarian economy. I think he was teaching them something that they instinctively knew at that moment. When he spoke of bread, what were they thinking about? They were thinking about God spreading a table in the desert. Manna in the morning, which they didn't plant, which they couldn't water, which they couldn't cultivate. All the things that a farmer does. It was there for them. And where did it come from? Not from the labor of their own hands. Where did it come from? It came from above. Now, you let that be your theology for life. And watch what God does. You let your relationship with Christ be first and foremost, paramount above all things. Your name, your reputation, what you do. And He will provide in ways manna was just completely unexpected and quite much a miracle, wasn't it? You know, doctors today are telling us to wash our hands, put on masks, social distance. All of those things are great. But there's something far more important than even that. And here it is. Walk in righteousness. Above all else. It's what Job said. I put on righteousness as my clothing. And I lived every day that way. That one single thing above all things is the most important thing for your daily life. You be generous. You be kind. You be known by your name. And the doors will open because God knows where to find you. What He's interested in is you and your relationship with Him. Only. Here's seven. A proverb that has three lines. The first two lines are quite clear. No one likes to be around the poor. Not their relatives, not their friends. This word brother is interesting. Not family here. This would be a member of the covenant community where we all in covenant provide and take care of one another. We would say in that vernacular, or in our own vernacular, I've got your back. That's what the word brother really entails. They commit to covenant solidarity. Who would provide for each other in adversity? So, they look at the poor, and the proverb says they hate him. Now we've seen that word before, hate. Same word, Proverbs 122, uh, 122. How long will scoffers delight in scoffing? How long will fools hate, that's our word, knowledge? Here's line two. It becomes the argument of logic. You see that? How much more? His close companions become distant. Now the word distant means to neglect, to abandon. It was Job's testimony in Job chapter 30 in verse 10. When he was broke and when he was in ill health, 
He said, people hated me. It's translated detest. It's our word to hate. Why? Because see, without money, without influence, you're nothing but a burden to people. And that's the way they think about you. But now look at line three here. He pursues, that's the poor one, with the idea to secure his life's way, and he does it by pleading. And look at the end result to that. No avail. Make your request be named to God only. Not to men. Whether they be relatives, people that you are sure would stand with you or not. That's the teaching of this proverb. Now I'm going to say something. It may not have the absolute security of the elders, but I'm a guest, so I'm going to say what I, are my own personal convictions about this matter. I've spent a lot of time with Dr. Johnson talking to him about money and about the way Christian ministries go about maintaining their ministries. And I'm all for secular service. I've given to them. St. Jude's Hospital, Wounded Warriors, Easter Seals. They all have a very valuable place in our society. I'm all for them. But they are not the church. And they are not the Christian ministry. There are two distinctives of the Christian ministry. There is what we believe and how we behave. And they don't conflict with one another. Our belief is, in fact, our behavior. Or it should be our behavior. When I first started attending Believer's Chapel as a young Christian, it wasn't long before my pagan father began to join me in the meetings. And it wasn't the exposition of the Scriptures that intrigued him so much. He had never heard anything like that. Matter of fact, he didn't even bring a Bible. He didn't know to bring a Bible. But the thing that he kept bringing up over and over and over again, where do they pass the plates around here? How do they keep the lights on around here? Somebody has to maintain this building. Where do they get their money from? And so he started taking a wad of bills and sticking them over here in the little side window. Didn't know what else to do. But you see, that made our message attractive, interesting. He had never seen anything like it. I've seen people go about raising money, pleading, pleading, pleading for the ministry. And I see the same result that I see here in the proverb. Look at it again. People are gone. Why? Because the message turns out to be all about your pleadings and nothing else. I've been invited to these lunches, lovely lunches, white tablecloth, and uh, people give up, give their testimony. But at the end of the meeting, this man stands up and says, now, under that plate you've been eating off of, flip it over. There's a card waiting there. I thought to myself, I thought I was being invited to eat lunch. Hear a testimony. You see, that shouldn't be a part 
of what we're doing. The gospel is free. And we make no pleadings to men in order to maintain the Word of God. That's what I believe. That's what Dr. Johnson bore down into my soul. God will sustain His ministry. I've had a ministry started, private foundation, for 25 years. Never ask a person for a thing. The line of people that we support and help, widows, orphans, missionaries, people of the Word, it grows longer and longer. I look at it and I say, only God can support this. And He does. Make no offer. Not interested in doing that. It's God sustaining His own ministry. And when it's over, it's over. There's no shame in that. God raises up things. He closes down things. We are interested in Him. Not how we're going to do this. We're interested in serving Him. And that's what it's about. These are my convictions. I didn't run them past the elders, but I have been in a lot of discussions with a lot of believers over these these very things. The distinctive of our ministry our, is our message and our lives. People are watching you. My father was watching what was going on at Believer's Chapel because we didn't pass a plate. And my father through the help of Howard Pryor, came to know Jesus Christ right here at this place. It's your name. It's your reputation. It's your message that works its way out in everyday life. And that's what communicates. And that's what becomes powerful. And that is what opens doors beyond anything you could ever imagine. I've seen it. It's the Word. It's the skill for living. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study together. How grateful we are to be back in the confines of this church and, and getting healthier as a society, Lord, uh, removing this plague from our midst and carrying on the common work of the ministry of the Word of God. We're missing Jeff Brown. We're missing Al and Angeles this morning. Uh, bless them. Bless their families and their homes. And protect them. And thank You for this opportunity to be together and share in the Word. In Jesus' name, Amen.